there is this undeniable human obsession with spectacle, with turning everything into content or some twisted show for our own entertainment. More often than not, the humanistic obsession with spectacle brings direct harm to animals. A chimpanzee forced to perform for the entertainment of a sitcom audience, a horse overstimulated and probed for commercial placement, or a creature from a distant planet recorded so that it might make some people famous and rich. But animals are not the only creatures affected by the human hunt for spectacle. We also see people themselves falling victim to this cycle of spectacleization. A token minority forced to perform for a sitcom audience, a black woman ready to sell herself by any means necessary in order to find success, or her brother who gets uneasy stares for nothing more than his name and the legacy it carries. These scenes are, of course, from Jordan Peele's 2022 film, Nope, and serve as stark reminders of Spectacle's downsides. Peel himself might be able to attest to the weight that spectacle carries, having himself become a kind of spectacle in horror and film as a whole in recent years for his sharp social and racial commentary. Being made into a spectacle is almost par for the course when it comes to the film industry, and it's something almost every acclaimed director must grapple with, but the spectacle Peel has been subject to definitely feels more exploitative than usual. Many fans, most of them white, flock to performatively engage with Peel's work, and the director has been open about feeling as though he's sometimes the token black horror director of Hollywood. But Peel also deals in spectacle. As a major director, he might understand better than almost anyone the innate human obsession with spectacleization. All too often, that spectacleization comes at the cost of something else. It might be something as simple as putting a celebrity on a pedestal and creating a disconnect in stress, or it might be something as serious as reducing an entire life down to a few shocking, viral seconds. Regardless, fully aware of how dangerous spectacle can be, most of us fall helplessly into its grasp nonetheless. We inherently love to engage in spectacle, but it feels, very justifiably, horrific when we ourselves become the victims of such spectacleization. When we come to understand our obsession with spectacle as a knife that cuts two ways, simultaneously exploiting us and often making us the arbiters of exploitation upon other things, we can begin to unpack the uneasy relationship nope has to spectacle, and the answers it gives us for how to deal with a society where spectacle is genuinely unavoidable. So using this contextualization as a starting point, I hope you'll join me today on this long-form exploration of spectacle, exploitation, and Jordan Peele's nope. So generally, I think Nope can be viewed from two distinct perspectives, both of which I'll explore here since I think they are equally valid and both provide an integral piece of the equation when it comes to understanding the central ideas behind Nope as a whole. For those of you watching this video despite having not seen Nope, or for those who can't remember exactly everything that happened in the movie, Here's a quick recap of the main characters and who they are. Firstly, we have OJ, who, after the passing of his father, inherits Haywood Ranch, a family-owned horse ranch that trains, handles, and loans out horses to film productions. Without the charismatic leadership of OJ's father, Haywood Ranch falls on hard times. Secondly, there's OJ's sister, Emerald, who, instead of following in the footsteps of her father to manage the horse business, breaks out on her own with dreams of becoming some type of star, whether it be an actor, comedian, dancer, singer, or really anything that will guarantee some type of fame. Next up, there's Angel, who is recruited by the Haywood family after OJ sees a UFO in the skies above the ranch one night, and he and Emerald resolve to capture it on film. Angel is the tech guy of the movie, but he is given a surprising amount of characterization, first appearing as an annoying nuisance to the main plot before transforming into one of the most likable and memorable characters of the film. And finally, we have Ricky Jupe Park, the owner of a local Western-themed amusement park inspired by a film he starred in as a child actor. Jupe was actually quite the prolific child star, serving as the lead for the sitcom Gordy's Home in the late 90s about a family who adopt a chimpanzee. We learn that the show ended horribly, with one of the chimps playing Gordy having a violent episode when he killed nearly the entire cast of the show, apart from Jupe, who 
narrowly survived the encounter. In the modern day of the film, Jupe is aware of the UFO lurking above Haywood Ranch and plans to utilize it as an attraction in his theme park. These are our four central characters in Nope, and automatically, we might come to understand some commonalities between them. For one, they are all people of color. As a person of color himself, Jordan Peele often makes films analyzing what it means to be a racial minority, more specifically, what it means to be a black person living in America. And it seems he's doing that here, as we'll explore more later on. Secondly, we must acknowledge the shaky connections each of these characters have with the entertainment industry. OJ is watching his family business die at the hands of a Hollywood system that doesn't want to deal with real animals or OJ himself. Of course, there's an understood racial component to OJ being disregarded by the Hollywood system, but one could very easily make an argument that OJ is neurodivergent, and it seems as though he's shunned for that as well. Emerald desperately desires to be accepted by the entertainment industry, but it's to the point that she's ready to be willingly exploited by it. We later see that, for as much as she might try to sell herself out to the industry, Emerald is not truly comfortable with being exploited for entertainment. There's obviously also a racial component to Emerald's characterization, with a well-documented history of black women being exploited in the entertainment industry weighing heavily over Emerald here. Jupe is the most obvious victim of the entertainment industry here. Traumatized by his horrific encounter with a chimpanzee from Gordy's home and his general youth as the token Asian character of various film properties. Then there's Angel. While his relationship to the entertainment industry is less obvious, it's not very subtle. As we learn, he went through a difficult breakup with an aspiring actress who abandoned him the second she found an opportunity in the industry, leaving Angel too long for a real connection with others. He was quite literally used by this persona of the Hollywood industry and now searches for something more authentic. So we have four people of color, each with negative stories of exploitation and or dismissal by the Hollywood system. And reading the film with this in mind, it becomes very apparent that Hollywood here, or really the whole culture of exploiting others for film, is harmful. Looking at the film's opening, we begin with a quote, a biblical one from Nom 36, that reads, I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you spectacle. And aside from establishing the overwhelming, inescapable horror of Nope as a whole, this quote serves to instantly solidify one of the film's central themes as spectacle and what it can take from us. Why is spectacle included here amidst threats of filth and corruption? Well, consider what being made into a spectacle truly entails. For every bit of pain or humiliation we as humans suffer, we can rely upon our own humanity. The understanding that our suffering comes in the context of a life and an identity. It's a small consolation, but a consolation nonetheless. Yet, to be made into spectacle is to be stripped of that life entirely. Your actions, whether good or bad, are consumed in a vacuum. You lose all agency, and your entire life is relegated to mere entertainment or fascination on the part of others. In a world where everyone has a phone and histories of exploitation through media are becoming more talked about than ever before, the weight and fear of being reduced to spectacle looms larger than ever. This is the type of fear that Nope explores, the entertainment industry becoming synonymous with the creation and manufacturing of spectacle. No matter how badly we might think we want to be made into a spectacle, what we ultimately find is that once that spectacle gets a hold of us, it will box us in and drain us for all we are worth, eventually spitting us back out as some empty mush of what we once were. That is, of course, if we are even deemed worthy of entry into this world of spectacle in the first place. There's always the possibility that it might reject us outright. And I guess with that being said, it's probably about time I start talking about the alien in this movie. Having grounded Nope in all these very real fears of being consumed for spectacle, it might now become apparent that the alien visitor around which the film is built serves as a representation of exploitative spectacle incarnate. From a mere design standpoint, that much is true, with the alien, referred to as Jean Jacket in the film, being crafted to elicit ideas of the spectacle itself. For one, the creature literally looks like an eye for much of the movie, as Peel plays upon the classic form of the flying saucer in 
science fiction. Yet once Jean Jacket unfurls into its final form, the creature's mouth eye thing bears a striking resemblance to a camera, further compounding this idea that Jean Jacket represents spectacle as exploitation. Whether we run from it or actively chase it down, the spectacle will destroy us in a horrific void of consumption. Remember that thing I said earlier about spectacle boxing us in, draining us, and spinning us back out? Well, turns out, in Nope, that's extremely literal. Gross. And this reading of Jean Jacket as a representation of spectacle itself plays into another central idea of Nope, the exploitation of animals for spectacle. Since they have no voice but are living creatures, it should come as no surprise that animals are probably the most exploited things of all by our culture of filmed consumption. In the real world, we have videos of animal abuse, even ones that can seem harmless, like big predators and prey hanging out. Videos that are often staged and can lead to, at the least, an immense amount of stress for the prey animal and and at worst, death for that animal. In Nope, we have the story of Gordy's home, where chimpanzees were exploited for entertainment and one of them broke under the pressure, killing and mauling cast members. We also have smaller instances of animal exploitation, like Jupe trying to feed a horse to Jean Jacket or one of OJ's horses being poked and prodded into an outburst on a commercial set. Jean Jacket, as a manifestation of the predatory film industry, devours innocent horses before turning to people as its primary source of consumption, outlining the ways in which people are reduced to nothing more than animals in the eyes of attention culture, and exploring the very real connection between exploited people and animals. Gordy and Jupe, even amidst the carnage of Gordy's rampage, share a moment of connection as exploited entities, and OJ feels a profound connection with his horses, who, much like himself, are shunned by the Hollywood industry for being as they are. By the end of the film, our main characters, with the notable exception of Jupe, who we'll discuss some more later on, are able to defeat the representation of exploitative spectacle. They give the alien a taste of its own medicine, capturing it on film and tricking it into eating a giant balloon of jupe, itself a representation of the hollow emptiness that spectacle is built on. It's also worth wondering if the reason our characters get to survive here is because they have historically been shunned from the entertainment industry. Jean Jacket represents the spectacle, and all of these characters have been barred, whether they want it or not, from the industry of spectacle. In fact, they use their skills gained outside that industry to defeat the creature in the end. Our characters take everything wrong with attention culture and tell Spectacle to choke on it, literally, ultimately regaining their autonomy and freedom from the oppressive weight of exploitation for entertainment. And that's a hell of a story on its own. Peel has once again crafted a masterful narrative of horror with a secret deeper meaning that underlines it all perfectly. But that's only half the story. There's another way in which I think Nope demands we look at it, and that's through the lens of Jean Jacket itself. For as much as the design of Jean Jacket is influenced by everyday objects like fabrics, cameras, and metal, it's also influenced by naturalistic creatures, from insects to octopi to jellyfish, and so on. What does this mean? Well, I think it clearly frames Jean Jacket as a natural creature in its own right, an animal that, while it might symbolize predatory exploitation, is exploited itself by those who wish to use it for their own benefit. For instance, Jupe organizes his show as a means to gawk at and profit from Jean Jacket. There is already an infamous obsession with documenting UFOs for personal profit and notoriety in the real world, and our main characters, from Angel to OJ to Emerald, all want to document Jean Jacket in some way for a personal gain, even if that gain is sympathetic, like wanting to save the Haywood Ranch. The central twist of Nope, if there even is one, is that Jean Jacket is not a ship of extraterrestrial visitors, but a living creature in its own right. It's a twist that makes the commentary of the film go two ways, much like our relationship to spectacle itself. That our main characters are suffering under the weight of exploitation and attention culture is undeniable but just as undeniable is the fact that they perpetuate that spectacle obsession themselves with their constant attempts to get Jean Jacket on film. This is probably why we receive this repeated symbol of the mirror in Nope. For as much as we might reject being looked at, are those onlookers not ultimately reflections of who we are intrinsically? Animalistically, we fear to be looked at, but also animalistically, we love to look. And these mixed messages speak volumes to our own messy relationship to spectacle. For as much as we might dislike being gawked at or have compassion for creatures often exploited for profit, 
we do ultimately all contribute to this culture of spectacle shit. If we didn't, we probably wouldn't have gone to see Nope in the first place. Nope is a spectacle movie, a send-up of classic horror-adjacent blockbusters like Jaws or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. For us to go see it is to engage with spectacle, and for Jordan Peele to make it is for him to capture spectacle, something Nope seems very against in some ways. So is there a solution to all this? Are we destined to live in this weird limbo state with spectacle forever? Well, to answer that question, I think we need to talk about cowboys. Historically, cowboys have been the leads of the western film genre. When traditionally defined by open desert expanses and the often strong, silent men who roam them on horseback. In western films, cowboys are often the archetype of humans as spectacle, gross exaggerations of what it means to be a person. They are motionless, devoid of character growth or evolution, bordering on mythological in nature. They are also predominantly white on screen, despite the fact that thousands of real life cowboys were people of color. We might actually call Nope itself a neo-western, a film that, while definitely not conforming to the western genre, is playing with the conventions and iconography of westerns as a whole. The film takes place on a vast open desert complete with horses and a strong silent lead, OJ, taking on the role of the cowboy in the film. And that's rather fitting, as the fictional Haywood family tie their lineage back to one of the first ever combinations of pictures to make a film, a short clip of a black man riding a horse, that man becoming possibly the first on-screen cowboy, in a sense. In real life, the horse's name is known, but the rider's name is not. The rider has been reduced entirely to spectacle, and convention would tell us that OJ, as both a black man and a cowboy, would be reduced entirely to spectacle himself. Shit, OJ's father another black cowboy, is reduced to spectacle in the opening moments of the film, as with little to no information about him, viewers watch as he is accidentally killed by Jean Jacket. Yet in Nope, by the time we realize Daniel Kaluuya is doing a spin on the archetype of the strong, silent cowboy, we've already become connected to and familiar with him as a character. He's already been humanized to us, and this means that at the end of the movie when Kaluuya's character OJ strikes an almost comically cowboy-like pose under a sign that evokes perfectly this western history of spectacle characters, he's able to avoid becoming a spectacle himself. Instead, OJ harnesses spectacle, using it as a means to elevate himself beyond the conventions of his identity. The cowboy becomes more than a spectacle, and OJ, a black, possibly neurodivergent character, gets to be cool and larger than life while still maintaining his humanity and identity. So I would argue Jordan Peele feels as though in a society where spectacle is unavoidable, the best thing we can do is understand that for every spectacle, there's a deeper reality underneath. Instead of portraying his creature as some mindless killing machine like the shark from Jaws, Peele prioritizes a healthy dose of sympathy for a jean jacket here, making sure the audience never hates the living UFO, but merely understands it as a predator doing what's in its nature. He also does a lot of character work here to ensure that his main cast never become mere spectacle themselves. Jupe is given a complex backstory that informs his actions. Angel, despite being comedic relief in many parts of Nope, never becomes too exaggerated for audiences to understand as a real person. And I mean, OJ and Emerald's relationship and characterizations are the core of this film. The only the only character you might be able to suggest is all one-dimensional spectacle is the TMZ reporter that shows up to question Emerald at the film's climax, but Peele deliberately chooses to make that character into a robotic, faceless machine of a human being. It becomes ironic how the only character fully obsessed with turning everything into a spectacle gets made into a complete spectacle himself. The character is also a reflection of Antlers, the nature photographer who helps Emerald in OJ capture footage of Jean Jacket and eventually dies because he's obsessed with with getting the perfect shot. Both characters are mysterious with robotic voices and they wear all black and are obsessed with filming things and die in pursuit of capturing something on camera. And Antlers is another character that might be a bit more spectacle than real person. It's a subtle commentary on the fact that the only real difference between an auteur filmmaker obsessed with exploitative spectacle and some TMZ reporter obsessed with it is really just perception and name recognition. But outside of that pointed, deliberate characterization, Peel has made a block blockbuster monster movie where 
almost every single character, even the monster, is humanized and transformed into more than just mere spectacle. It's artful stuff and stands as a real testament to how valuable spectacle cinema can be when used correctly. Moments like the death of OJ's father, the raining of blood on the Haywood home, or the mass consumption of 30 or so guests at Jupe's cowboy theme park. These are all hard-hitting, engaging scenes in their own right. But when we gain the full context of what a character death means, understand the animalistic instinct driving a horrific action, or come to acknowledge a disturbing scene as the payoff to a complex character arc, those moments elevate themselves and the characters that they include. That's when spectacle becomes something more. The entire goal of Nope seems to be capturing Jean Jacket on film, but once Jean Jacket is photographed and the alien chokes on a massive balloon of Jupe's likeness, the ending still feels pretty damn hollow and empty. It's only when OJ arrives that we can truly celebrate this ending, for spectacle is entirely hollow without a deeper human connection there to make it worth something. And the same goes for Nope itself. What so many blockbuster films forget is that the only reason we show up beyond the pretty effects or fight scenes is human connection and the exploration of how people might interact with larger than life forces. All the best spectacle films speak to some deeper theme, whether that be Gojira's reckoning with the atomic bombs dropped on Japan through the lens of a giant kaiju, or Cloverfield's unpacking of 9-11 through the use of otherworldly monsters. I love Jaws, I love Jurassic Park, I love Aliens, and I love Nope. And of course, I think all the big action scenes and cool creatures in those movies are wonderful, but I love those films because they have great characters, deep ideas, and something to say about humanity beyond look at people fight and kill this creature. Jordan Peele has pulled off this insane meta thing where he's made a blockbuster deconstruction of what it means to make a blockbuster or any type of spectacle content. The deeper meaning is that this movie has a deeper meaning, if that makes any sense. And with that, I want to get into some particulars of Nope. Nope begins with two scenes, both of them depicting bad miracles, as the film calls them. The first is the incident on Gordy's home, where the chimpanzee playing Gordy goes wild and kills most of the cast. This bad miracle is made into a spectacle, signified by its commodification on SNL and in Mad Magazine. Jupe, a victim of the very real incident that the spectacle is based on, refuses to directly confront the darker reality hiding underneath it, couching his experiences in parodies of the event. Instead of exploring the spectacle as an example of the predatory entertainment industry, or as an example of Jupe's own exploitation as a child star and token Asian actor, he falls into the spectacle, using it to look for some deeper, comforting meaning to this horrible event that truly has none. He sees himself as chosen, as special, never confronting the truth that lies behind the traumatic spectacle. To Jupe, everything was a sign of his higher purpose. The incident was explainable, a clear indication that he was chosen by some higher power for some greater role. His being spared couldn't have been the happy accident of his eye contact with Gordy being obscured by a tablecloth. It was ordained. The shoe landing perfectly upright couldn't have been a meaningless event and must have hidden some deeper message. This response to bad miracles is one inherently tied to the spectacle. When we as people are confronted with terrible things that have no simple or understandable answer, we force ourselves to rationalize and understand them by any means necessary. Oftentimes, we seek a deeper meaning that is simply not there to shield ourselves from a difficult reality. We must transform these events into spectacles so that we might detach ourselves from them and strip them of whatever deeper meaning they might have spoken to in their original form. Additionally, we can take these horrible events and use them to our own benefit when we limit them to mere spectacle, as can be seen in how Jupe literally collects Gordy's home merchandise for profit and transforms his childhood career of exploitation into an amusement park. We bypass confrontation with reality and choose instead to bend that reality to fit our limited definitions of the world. Definitions where we deserve success and fame. Definitions where bad things have have an explanation, or at the least, a silver lining. We can talk all day about how the word for bad miracles might be wish or a spectacle, but the truth is we already have a word for bad miracles, and that word is... Nope. 
The second of the bad miracles that opens the film is the death of Pops at the hands of the UFO, Jean Jacket. The UFO and the destruction it delivers perfectly encompass the idea of a bad miracle, a horrible thing that can't be easily explained or understood, much like the Gordy's home incident. It seems random and cruel, yet OJ and Emerald don't wish to acknowledge the bad miracle for what it is at first. They refuse to confront it head on and instead seek to fall into the spectacle, photographing the UFO for profit and notoriety without ever grappling with the trauma it reveals and instills. Angel also claims the hunt for photographic evidence of Jean Jacket serves a more humanitarian purpose yet he seems to be the only one who truly believes this. And Angel's words only serve as another example of how we as people use spectacle to rationalize bad things as serving some higher purpose. Jean Jacket is random and horrible, but when it's turned into a spectacle, suddenly the creature becomes a means to save lives, maybe even the whole earth. Yet when our main characters finally get their photographic evidence, the film keeps going, showing the horror of embracing spectacle in full with the death of antlers and then allowing the characters to confront what lies behind that spectacle head on. A representation of their own obsessions with exploitation, a history of disenfranchisement in the film industry, a rough family relationship still being patched together, and everything in between. By the conclusion, the UFO has been captured on film, yes, but the spectacle has become merely a vehicle through which our main characters are able to grapple with everything that said spectacle represents and shines light upon. They reclaim their legacy as cowboys and filmmakers, they solidify their family bond, they save their ranch, they build community, etc. Yes, the spectacle still exists, and our relationship to it still looms large, reflected in the body of Jean Jacket that floats ominously in the air and in the sea of reporters rushing into Jupiter's claim, but the future hinted at is one where spectacle becomes not a means of denying and minimizing the truth, but a vehicle through which reality can be elevated, explored, and confronted head on. So a bad miracle is something awful, and usually something we choose to deny through the creation of a spectacle around it. But when we use spectacle to tackle these bad miracles head on, we can build an understanding of ourselves and and the world that's rooted firmly in reality. Despite being historically relegated to spectacle and exploitation themselves, the Haywood family are able to reclaim spectacle here and use it not to downplay, but to elevate important issues, and not to minimize, but to uplift themselves. And it might be worth questioning if Jordan Peele, as a black filmmaker so often turned into spectacle, is doing the exact same thing with Nope. Just some food for thought. <music> If you like nothing else about Nope, chances are you enjoy the soundtrack. It's for the most part a throwback to the black music of the 60s and 70s, with some cool gems from elsewhere sprinkled in for good measure. But there's one song in particular that I'd like to hone in on here. The track is called Exuma the Obia Man, a song from Exuma's 1970 album of the same name. The track is a propulsive folktale-like origin for the artist singing it, and fully embraces science fiction and religious iconography to paint a picture of Exuma as a larger-than-life character. And the inclusion of this song got me wondering about Nope as a whole, specifically if Peel intentionally included a similar blend of the fantastical and the religious in his film. As much as Jean Jacket references a history of UFO speculation, the creature also resembles biblically accurate angels, these unexplainable creatures that seem entirely impossible. Furthermore, Peel outright admitted that the design of Jean Jacket was inspired by the angels from the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, so it's basically impossible to argue that there's not some religious context to Jean Jacket. To again return to Exuma's 1970 debut album and the final track of that record called The Vision, Azuma tells the story of seven angels who descend upon earth to bring destruction and ruin to humankind. In the context of Nope, the destruction brought by these angels is definitely grounds for a bad miracle. They bring fire to the sky, turn Earth's water to blood, punish the wicked, and much more. Behavior we might associate closely with our very own jean jacket, who does much the same. Shit, the opening quote of Nope is literally a Bible verse alluding to this idea that God will come down and reduce us to a spectacle. So could it be possible that jean jacket is a force from some higher power sent down to reprimand us? Could it be 
be that our main cast is being punished and tested for their blind obsessions and fixations upon spectacle? Well, that surely is an interesting theory. And if you want to interpret the film that way, have at it. But I would argue it's much more nuanced than that. The religious iconography is here, no doubt about it, but I would hardly say Jordan Peele has crafted Nope as a celebration of religion. If that were the case, then we might be able to see our own main characters as chosen in a sense. And as Jupe shows us in his misguided death, believing oneself to be chosen is, at best, an unhealthy coping mechanism for traumatic and difficult realities, a form of self spectacalization At worst, it becomes a horrible obsession that leads us to put our ourselves and others in real danger. We would also have to believe everything in the film to be preordained, a part of some bigger picture that we could easily glorify and celebrate. And isn't that kind of the opposite of what Nope wants us to do? Yeah, no. Instead of a celebration of organized religion, I would argue Nope is actually a subtle condemnation of it and an expression of how religion might truly be the greatest spectacle of all. Religion was developed as a means for humans to grapple with the ills and mysteries of the world. The bad miracles that dominate human existence. In a mission to make sense of our reality, humans turned everything into a spectacle, into a show. Life itself became a piece of some larger narrative and thus became more understandable. We fit our world into something we could comprehend. What Peel has done here is given us all the pieces to write off the bad miracles of Nope as religious in nature, to see them as a test from some higher power or as the punishments of a wrathful god. Yet the challenge is to not take the easy way out, to not blindly seek some religious explanation instead of confronting the deeper issues that the film represents. The religious subtext becomes very much like the shoe that so many people obsess over when it comes to this film. Is it there? Yes, but it's a false flag, a test of if we will look upon these horrible events for what they are or if we will glorify them according to our own obsessions. It's all too easy to interpret the quote that begins the film, the biblical references contained throughout, the naming of a character as angel, or the miraculous ways in which our main cast survive as signs of some religious presence that neatly explains away the entire Entire movie, but Peel knows that, and he's testing us in the moment. And for anyone skeptical that the filmmaker is literally checking our ability to not fall into a spectacle, to again return to the shoe, what is that if not a test? In universe, it's a test for Jupe, when he fails, and one that leads him to an early, horrific death. But in the real world, it's also a test for us. Do we take the shoe as some linchpin for the entire movie, a sign that everything that happens within is part of some grander orchestration with neat explanations? No, the shoe isn't fucking important. What's important is the actual issues explored here, the bad miracles we have to confront head on without mindlessly slipping into the spectacle of the film. And having made the majority of all my points, I'd like to do a quick bonus round of interesting or fun things from Nope that I didn't get to mention because there's just so much more to this film than what I've been able to tackle here. So it's bonus less time. Here are a few things I love about Nope. The amazing scene of Angel, OJ, and Emerald in a diner where they are ignoring the traumatic reality of having blood rain down upon them by Jean Jacket, while we, the audience, literally ignore a fight in the background, purposefully focusing on something else that's more important to our limited perspective as a viewer. I mean, talk about effective commentary on how people refuse to acknowledge shit because we'd rather focus on something else. The way Pops is killed by a coin, symbolizing the erasure of the black cowboy by cinema, the ways that money can lure us into death at the hands of spectacle, and how we all inherently have two sides within us acting as both the exploiter and the exploited depending on the scenario. The fact that OJ wears orange in the finale while Emerald wears green. I'm sure you could tie this back to the idea that they're becoming spectacle at the end here, but I just think it's something fun to notice. The way the film is segmented by title cards all referencing animals who die in that act of the film. This brings attention to the animals and their deaths, leading us to see them as important, i.e. more than spectacle, also, the only animal who gets a card and doesn't die is Lucky. Very ironic. The fact that Emerald is a lesbian, and more people should talk about that because we love lesbian representation. That's all. The way that Jean Jacket kind of looks like a big cowboy hat, making this scene
scene of Jupe's hat getting blown off really resonate in the moment as, oh shit, Jupe is powerless here. Also, I'm like 90% sure that Jupe's hat in the poster is secretly Jean Jacket. The way OJ did this eye contact thing with Emerald as a child so she would feel seen and acknowledged even when he got to help their dad on a movie set and she didn't. He does the same thing at the finale to show his love for her, but it also plays on the concepts of the film. We are repeatedly reminded that staring is bad, whether it be to provoke an animal or to turn something into a spectacle, but OJ's looking at Emerald is interpreted here as him really seeing her for more than a mere spectacle. OJ understands her as a full human. This is the right kind of spectacle, the kind that elevates. And beyond even those points, there is much more I would have loved to talk about in more detail and a bunch I'm quite sure I'm missing about Nope as a whole. This is a film that just keeps giving and I would actually say it's probably Jordan Peele's masterpiece, at least so far. I love Get Out to Death. It's such an important horror movie and an undeniable instant classic and Us is a great progression of the groundwork laid by Get Out, even though I think it gets a bit lost behind its scope. But Nope is this perfect melding of the sharp storytelling in Get Out and the expansive commentary scene in Us. I am very, very happy that the studio just gave Jordan Peele money and let him loose to do whatever crazy interesting thing he wanted to. Nope feels like this complete mastery of aesthetics and message and filmmaking, the type of movie that personally makes me love movies. Let me know in the comments any lingering thoughts you have about Nope yourself, and until next time, I have been Ellie, you have been wonderful, and I'll see you soon. Bye! Hi everyone, I am back here at the end screen to tell you about some really cool new developments happening right now with my channel. If you're interested in getting more info about everything I'm going to discuss here, I would highly recommend watching the YouTube video I just made on this that should uh, have, have a link to it popping up in the corner up here somewhere, but that's going to go a little bit more detail into everything. But uh, basically, first off, the channel is very close to getting monetized, which would mean I could actually make some money off my content uh, going forward. That would obviously be awesome uh, for me in my personal life, but also it would be great for getting more videos out to you guys on a pretty consistent basis. So if you want to support the channel in a fairly easy way, uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, uh, turn on notifications, just anything to help me get my content out there to the wonderful people I want it to reach. Also, I started a Patreon. If you're at all interested in supporting me uh, with real money and getting some awesome extra bonus content, I would highly suggest that you go over to Patreon and join a donation tier. There are detailed descriptions of every single tier of my Patreon on the site, and also in that video I already mentioned that I made for the channel all about my Patreon. So go watch that or head over to the site. Either are. Just as a general example of the content I have over there, for only $5 a month, you could have seen this very video a full week in advance. And that's going to go for the remainder of my content for the foreseeable future. So if early access to videos sounds at all interesting to you, maybe look into the Patreon. Overall, I'm very excited for the future of this channel, and I hope you guys will support me as I try to spread my content and bring it to new fans who haven't yet encountered my work. Um, until next time, I love you. Bye-bye for real this time. I'll see you guys soon.